Unfortunately, you get to just sit there with your smiling face. Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna go ahead and start now in um, true respect of Malcolm's time. Um, and his participants may join us throughout the course of the webinar. And again, it is being recorded. Uh, today, I'm just gonna go through a few housekeeping items. First off, my name is Rick Jewell, and I am an executive with the Aurora Mental Health Center. I will be acting as a moderator for today's webinar. This is our fifth webinar in the series, however, there still may be some technical difficulties because I'm not a guru at it yet. I have muted and stopped video feed for all participants in order for all to focus on the presenter as well as, the, as well as to protect your individual privacy. This webinar is being recorded and will be utilized for both the Aurora Chamber of Commerce and the Aurora Mental Health Center's internal and external audiences in order to continue supporting our community during this challenging time. To further protect your individual privacy, each of you have the ability to click on the three dots on the upper right hand side, right hand of your individual screens, and then rename yourself, or even just put in dot 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 in place of that. When we get to the Q&A section during the last 10 to 20 minutes of today's webinar, please direct all questions to me, Rick Jewell, via the chat privately. I will go ahead and state the question out loud to the presenter and all. This will promote more privacy as to who is asking the question. If you so choose to keep your name visible, uh, that is fine. And if you wish me to unmute your audio so that you can ask the question directly at that time, please state so in your private chat message to me at the time. The chat feature, for those of you who may not know, is found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. It will open up a chat feature box to the right automatically defaults to everyone and you can just change the everyone in the drop down to say my name Rick Jewell in order to send the questions to me privately and you may go ahead and send questions throughout the course of the presentation today um, however they would be held to be asked at the Q&A time at the end at this point in time I would like to introduce Malcolm Job um, who I'm just now meeting for the first time myself and I'm a colleague of his so Malcolm, um, welcome and thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. I appreciate the invitation. Absolutely. I will, you want me to pull that PowerPoint up now? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. And I apologize, we have uh, a neighbor doing construction right now, so you might hear some um, buzzsaw go off. So I apologize if there's some um, white noise in the background. Completely fine. <laughs> so what I have here is about um, a 20-page 
uh, PowerPoint um, from a recent internal training, uh, rural mental health with all of the different clinical programs. And it highlights uh, the different substance related programs um, that are available through the agency, um, how to access those services, some um, data pertaining to um, number of folks that are coming in, um, the kinds of um, drug and alcohol uh, problems that we're seeing. Um, and it also gives some data um, about the state of Colorado and national in terms of what we've been looking at um, in drug and alcohol treatment over the last few years. So um, bear with me, I'll read through some of these. Some of them are, are fairly quick and then hopefully we'll have some time at the end for questions and answers. Uh, the first we have is a definition of alcohol addiction. It's a disease that changes the way the brain works. It causes negative emotions, impulsive behavior, cravings, and withdrawal symptoms. Treatment for alcohol addiction includes supervised detox, counseling and therapy, and support group participation. This graph shows um, the types of illicit drugs that are used um, nationally um, the most prevalent use that we see here is marijuana. That's no longer illicit in Colorado, but it is in uh, most of the country still. Um, it is, you know, very strongly the, the most used illicit drug, um, and it uh, partners very frequently with alcohol use. Um, from that, you see a, a, a sharp decline into uh, other drugs and other illicit drugs that um, are extremely impactful um, in terms of um, mental capacity, functioning, um, and even correlations with homelessness, criminal behavior, and so forth. Um, prescription pain relievers goes down to 3%, cocaine too, um, various uh, stimulants, tranquilizers, hallucinogens, and methamphetamine down in the two and less than 1%. Uh, illicit drug use and treatment, 22.7 million Americans needed treatment for drug or alcohol problems uh, in 2013, which was the most recent um, source that we had for that data point. Um, and disappointingly, only 2.5 million actually sought and received the treatment um, out of that um, 22.7 million that, that needed it. Uh, 27 million Americans, 12 or older, were um, currently using illicit drugs. And 2.5% of Americans, 12 or older, misused uh, pain relievers, tranquilizers, stimulants, or sedatives. Um, another definition, drug addiction is a chronic brain disease. It tricks the brain into thinking that drugs are essential despite negative consequences. Uh, addiction compels individuals to go to great lengths to acquire their drugs of abuse. Uh, it's also defined uh, as a chronic and relapsing brain disease. So depending on the substance, uh, the intensity of use and the length of use, it actually alters the brain and in some instances uh, permanently. Um, some drugs you're able to do a full recovery from with years and years of treatment. Some like methamphetamine um, could actually uh, in a very significant manner um, change the content of the brain and make a full recovery very challenging. Sorry about that. Next slide. Uh, here are some uh, common prescription drugs um, uh, related to addiction. Adderall, which is a upper stimulant, benzodiazepines of various sources. Um, this would be your Valium, Xanax, Ativan. Uh, fentanyl, uh, it's a synthetic opioid, um, 50 plus uh, times as potent as morphine. Um, we've yet to see it impact Aurora from a treatment perspective in a significant way, but that is something that we're keeping our eye on. And in other places in Colorado, especially southeastern Colorado, it's 
um, been a, a real concern because even just incidental contact with it and entering the bloodstream has led to uh, overdoses and very quick death. And so that's a very, very dangerous drug uh, when um, people try to use it recreationally. Hydrocodone, um, which is in Vicodin, Percocet, Oxycontin, um, opioid pain relievers in general. Treatment. So detox is the process of letting the body remove the drugs that are in it. The purpose of detox is to safely manage withdrawal symptoms when someone stops taking drugs or alcohol. Um, SUD treatment, and SUD stands for Substance Use Disorder, involves evaluation and stabilization with uh, medical interventions and psychological therapy. The goal is to prevent any form of harm to the patient. Providers work with patients to prevent complications from withdrawal and acquire healthy coping skills to maintain stabilization. Dual diagnosis treatment, so depression and PTSD in particular, are common illnesses um, that can be devastating if untreated. People who suffer from these uh, often turn to alcohol or drugs to feel better, but end up developing another dangerous condition instead. Healthcare professionals can treat both depression, PTSD, and substance use disorders together to aid in recovery. And the flip side of the coin for depression is anxiety as well. So depression, anxiety, and PTSD, and PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. So this is related to um, a traumatic event, which is still very prevalent in someone's life and um, impacts their ability to function day-to-day uh, -day in normal ways. Uh, medically assisted treatment or medication assisted treatment, otherwise known as MAT, um, is the medical component to help folks along with uh, working a recovery program and doing some types of um, uh, therapy. Now, Trexone is a really popular one. It's used as an adjunct to social and psychotherapy in the treatment of opioid and alcohol addiction. People taking naltrexone uh, need to have completely stopped taking all types of opioids seven to, ten, seven to 10 days prior to starting it. Uh, it's prescribed for alcohol dependence and uh, opiate dependence. It may off also be prescribed off-label for fibromyalgia, um, trichotillomania, and smoking cessation. And you can take it uh, either as a monthly injection um, or as a daily um, oral pill. Suboxone is another uh, uh, medication which has shown um, good results. Um, it's a combination medicine uh, containing buprenorphine and naloxone that is used to treat adults addicted to opioid medications. It should be used in conjunction with a complete treatment program that includes counseling and behavioral therapy. Although less likely to be abused than methadone, the potential for abuse still exists and it's prescribed for opiate dependence. And it often comes um, in uh, the form of a like a clear film that you just let rest uh, uh, on your tongue and absorb it orally. And it um, takes away uh, cravings. Um, it is misused more and more on the streets now for folks that are trying to maintain and avoid a withdrawal uh, coming on in between um, episodes of heroin use. Um, from a treatment perspective, um, it's really intended to be a bridge. Uh, so between heavy use um, at stage one, all the way to in, uh, at a near future date of six to 12 months, um, being able to be completely abstinent. So it would be an alternative to methadone, which is um, uh, a daily medication that one takes permanently for the rest of their life in order to stay off of heroin. The Suboxone um, shows a lot of utility and success in helping people to transition from everyday use to total abstinence. Uh, special populations that we see and work with, Mental Health Drug Court is a specialized court that seeks to craft a meaningful response to the problems posed by defendants and co-occurring substance abuse and mental illness in the criminal justice system. 
The court aims to improve the court system's ability to identify, assess, evaluate, and monitor offenders with mental illness, uh, create effective linkages between the criminal justice and mental health systems, and improve public safety by ensuring that participants receive high quality community-based services. Uh, a 2012 study published in Occupational Medicine revealed that 56% of career firefighters were past month binge drinkers. Um, so this slide uh, addressing firefighters um, and then the next slide which is going to address um, law enforcement shows the impact uh, of uh, essential workers, really vital community supports that uh, are experiencing um, really intense on the job situations that um, are upsetting, um, that are very intense, could be life threatening. Um, and that they, uh, while very strong mentally and physically and emotionally in order to do these jobs in the first place, uh, are still very vulnerable, just like the rest of the population to experiencing um, trauma, anxiety, depression, and then seeking substances for some type of relief. Uh, 2011 study published in the American Journal on Addiction surveyed more than 700 law enforcement officers and found 18.1% of male officers and 15.9% of female officers um, reporting uh, having experienced adverse consequences from alcohol use. And nearly 8% of the officers met criteria for alcohol abuse or dependence. Police officers risk their lives to protect their communities. However, the pressure and stress associated with the job lead some toward substance abuse. Police departments across the country are implementing programs to help their employees avoid such problems and treatment centers are readily available for those battling addiction. CTCC slash SATS, um, that stands for uh, Community Transitions Counseling Center and SATS is Substance Abuse Treatment Services. And these are both available through Aurora Mental Health Center. Uh, accepts offender referrals for mental health, for SUD, substance use disorder, and DD, developmentally disabled from criminal justice sources like uh, Department of Corrections, Parole, Probation, Courts, and Department of Human Services. These individuals are mandated to treatment. Uh, Self-referrals should seek services through our SUD clinic. So folks that um, may have similar issues to um, those seeking services through our SUD clinic when law enforcement is, is making this a requirement, um, they have to follow a certain uh, course of action, a certain chain of events um, and services. And um, the services could look similar in these different programs, but they're tailored for different populations. Our CTCC programs include SATS, jail-based behavioral health services, reentry program, Arapaho diverts mentally ill for treatment, otherwise known as ADMIT, that program, and the Aurora Municipal Wellness Court and Second Chance Center. East Metro Detox and Recovery Services, and this program in addition to our stud outpatient services are the two programs that I oversee. Um, our detox program is a 30 bed uh, clinic uh, with 24 seven operations. We work every day, every hour. Uh, we contract with 10 Metro Police Departments, Aurora, Arapahoe County, Colorado State Patrol, Douglas County, among the biggest. And we also contract with 22 Metro hospitals with the University Hospital and the Medical Center, Center of Aurora um, being the biggest referral sources. Um, and so what that, what both of those relationships and contracts um, involve is with law enforcement, being a detox facility for folks that have been cited in some way. So um, receiving a DUI, DWAI, um, some sort of public disturbance where they needed to be removed from that scene uh, and brought to an area um, that is able to monitor their acute intoxication or acute withdrawal. If it was a straight up crime uh, that required them to go to jail 
if they were completely sober, for example, they would bypass our program, but a lot of stuff happens when folks are intoxicated. And um, after properly processed, uh, according to whatever they were cited for by the police, they then transfer um, custody to us to monitor the rest of their um, uh, sobering up process and to monitor for any sort of um, acute withdrawal symptoms. Uh, and with the metro area hospitals, we have a fleet of vans that um, actually goes to all of the 22 hospitals we contract with into the emergency departments and um, screens and for those in criteria. Uh, actually transport them from the hospital emergency department uh, into our clinic for services. General admission criteria for detox, 18 and older, uh, meet the American Society of Addiction Medicine or ASAM. Uh, it's a screening tool, level of care for what's considered to be a 3.2 withdrawal management level of care, and that's a social model detox for monitoring and supporting adults under the influence of alcohol or other substances uh, in an active withdrawal. So someone could be recently sober, but perhaps they're going through tremors or nausea. Um, for example, opiate uh, withdrawal could go on for three, four, five days um, post um, um, uh, sobering up from an actual use. And so they could uh, inject, perhaps be high for 12 hours, and then still need up to a five-day detox after that. Alcohol, you're able to with um, recover from a little bit faster. Um, so our typical stay is one to two days with a max of about five. And we also need to make sure that they're medically stable because we're um, not a medical detox for a social model. Just some stats to throw at you. Um, for the fiscal year, last fiscal year, 18 to 19, uh, East Metro Detox did 3,854 intakes, 1,185 of those hospital contract um, transports. 150 emergency commitments were written, and those are um, holds, those are emergency holds. It's a 24 hour hold that you can renew daily for up to five days for folks that are in acute withdrawal um, and they present some sort of danger to themselves. They're not able to uh, make rational decisions. Um, they represent a danger to themselves or others and 19 involuntary commitment treatment placements, and those are court ordered up to seven months. And so we uh, collaborate with the state of Colorado, uh, Office of Behavioral Health, um, and the various courts uh, within the counties that we oversee, um, Arapahoe County and Douglas County, um, and getting folks into mandated treatment. Those are folks that have probably had numerous emergency commitments along the way but it, their addiction, their affliction is of su such severity that the state of Colorado actually had to intervene and mandate treatment. 90% of the clients coming to detox only need our services one time, and the average day was one to two days. Uh, primary substances of use that, that we see in detox, it's about 75% alcohol or alcohol and another drug. Um, and methamphetamine is actually our number two. Um, it's uh, more of a problem for our community right now in Aurora than, um, than heroin and a lot of the other prescription opioids uh, and cocaine as well. Our team consists of shift coordinators, addiction technicians, case managers, peer support specialists um, who work together to coordinate the appropriate level of care once folks are sober and stable. Referral process for outpatient. And so this would be once folks are um, no longer in acute intoxication or withdrawal, but they're wanting longer term services. And this could take a um, different forms from a traditional outpatient to an intensive outpatient, um, DUI classes and so forth. There's a variety of different um, educational classes and skills um, building classes that are available in our outpatient program. Um, and so these are the contact information, um, how to get in touch with those programs uh, for a referral. Uh, an intake department will complete an ASAM, and that's that screening tool that we saw on a previous page, um, with the client to determine what level of care, what level of service would be most appropriate. We have walk-in days every Tuesday. Uh, the better part of Tuesday is um, 
uh, devoted to new folks that, that come in and we're able to screen and provide on the spot assessments. That has changed now with um, the lockdown and stay at home orders. Uh, we have completely converted our outpatient program to telehealth. And so we are able to do um, uh, referrals, uh, the processing of referrals, screens, assessments, and ongoing treatment through telehealth. And that could be um, through um, Zoom, and it could also be through phone only, whatever uh, is preferred by the clients. And this is just going over again, more of the process and procedure for the outpatient team. After assessment is completed by a clinician, the clinician will inform the client of their recommended level of care, um, such as group or individual therapy, the, uh, the MAT services that we referenced earlier. After an assessment is completed by a clinician, the client will be scheduled um, by the front desk for a treatment planning session, schedule an appointment for MAT services if recommended, um, and will be set up on random UAs, which are urine analysis testing. And that goes with a lot of our um, programs, and it uh, is a very useful tool for accountability. Um, and most of it is voluntary, as most of our groups and programs are voluntary. So we get a lot of buy-in from folks that are uh, receiving services to do this, to hold themselves accountable for staying sober. And then the client will start attending services. I think we reached the end. Super. Let's stop the share here. I'll check the chat. Um, it looks as if we do not have any questions that have come in during the course of the presentation. Um, so I will go ahead and unmute Vivi Poole from the Aurora Chamber of Commerce and see if she has any comments that she would like to make. And thank you very much, Malcolm. That was very informative for me. Great. My pleasure. Malcolm, thank you so much on behalf of the Chamber of Commerce. Some really great information. And, um, you know, we're seeing uh, these rates climb at this point, um, unfortunately. But we want to do as much as we can to help people in any situation that they have. And um, if you can give a shout out to Debbie Stafford. I actually saw her on the news this morning. Oh, very nice. Yep, yeah, yeah, she looks great representing Aurora Mental Health. So we just thank you guys for everything that you're doing to support our members and the community during these trying times. This is really much needed because we know that there's a financial aspect of it, but there's a mental uh, and emotional aspect too. And depending on how we emotionally handle these times will depend a lot on how we come through the times. So we just thank you so, so much. Um, Rini Samard and Kevin Hogan, our president and vice president, they weren't able to make it today, but they wanted me to thank you as well. And uh, we look forward to your uh, future webinars with our members too. So thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful. I appreciate thank that. Thank you, Rick, for being such a fabulous host as you always are. Oh, you're very kind. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I just posted uh, Aurora Mental Health Center on our main contact number uh, in the chat feature here, 303-617-2300. And I did want to point out that during this time, we have a support line that you can speak to a live person anytime between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., seven days a week. So that's just an added benefit, um, resource for individuals, and they don't even have to be open to Aurora Mental Health Center. So I just wanted to share that with the, the group. If anyone has any questions on that, just let me know. Thank you, Rick. You're welcome. Well, if nobody has any more comments or questions at this point in time, I will say thank you again to Malcolm, and I think we will um, wrap this webinar up. Okay, thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. You, you as well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.